This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Craig Ross about rapidly aligning collaborative teams. Craig Ross, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. John, it's a real pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited to have a conversation and pick your brain. And and I appreciate you being willing to share your time and your wisdom with me and my listeners today. We're going to be focusing on rapidly aligning collaborative teams. And I know that's the tagline of your business. That's something you spend all of your time and energy focusing on. So I'm super excited to explore this. And it really is at the heart of a lot of what we try to accomplish in the innovation space as we're trying to help teams optimize and, and be more effective. Uh, As we get started, I wanted to share Craig's bio with everybody. From today's most innovative mid-size organizations to esteemed global Fortune 100 companies, Craig Ross, who is the CEO of Veris Global, is a trusted partner to leaders around the world, equipping them with the proven tools and processes to immediately increase their capabilities, create stronger work teams, and accelerate business results. His latest award-winning book, Do Big Things, The Simple Steps, teams can make to mobilize hearts and minds and make an epic impact is grounded in 65,000 hours of research, observing, studying, and working with extraordinary teams across 29 different industries and 38 countries and captures how these teams, whether they were newly formed, completely virtual, or had been together for years, overcame significant challenges and achieved remarkable outcomes. You are a man after my own heart. All of that is exactly the type of stuff I get so excited about, and I'm super thrilled to have the chance to chat with you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? Uh, You know, only that uh, I've got an incredible life partner uh, and four children. And and, uh, if there's important work in my life, that's my greatest work. And, uh, very, very grateful to have a, a whole life and abundance in that area of my life as well. That's all I'd add. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. I love my family as well. Uh, I, you probably have a little bit of time on me, but I've been married for about 20 years, six children. And, and uh, that's what makes it all worth doing, right? Everything, that's all true. the, all the work that we do and the grind that we go through and that, the value we try to add is all ultimately for our families. So Indeed. that's fantastic. All right. Well, as we get going, uh, perhaps you can just explain a little bit about Veris Global. Uh, Again, like I said, the kind of the framing for this episode is actually the tagline to your company, Rapidly Aligning Collaborative Teams. So give us a little bit bit of background to Veris, and and then we can dive on in. 
You got it. I'll be brief. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think organizations uh, get caught up in mistakes with the best of intentions, John, is we know we need to develop leaders. We know we need to develop our culture. Uh, there's no leader anywhere that I'm aware of that's going to raise their hand and say, no, nah, we shouldn't do that. Yet at the end of the day, how effective are organizations at doing it? And one of the primary reasons why there's such a high failure rate, in our opinion, is that it's an, it's an exercise that is separated from the thing that each leader has to do. And that's a, they've got to deliver what we call a business imperative. There's a number at the end of the day that I'm responsible for delivering, that I'm going to be held accountable. My career is at stake. All too often, culture initiatives fail because they're culture initiatives. They're not a business imperative initiative. And so one of the things that um, we broadcast loud and clear, I'd love to see more organizations do it, is, hey, let's start, first start with identifying what is the number you have to deliver, and then what's the human imperative behind that? That if we, what, align more effectively, collaborate more effectively, trust one another more effectively, we'll deliver and, and people will quickly identify that. And then we'll say, okay, here's how we do it in the flow of work so that I can hit that number at the end of the day in a way that allows me to sleep better at night because the human beings are better humans because of it. Yeah, that's excellent. And I love the people-centric, the human-centered approach to what you just described and it, but but it has to connect with the business case and it has to, you have to be able to speak the language of the rest of the executive team sitting around the table uh, i was reading you know oftentimes we talk about in the hr field people are saying we just need hr to get a seat at the table and i was reading an interesting article the other day it might have been harvard business review i can't remember uh, but essentially they were saying no HR doesn't need a seat at the table. They do definitely need to be part of the conversation. I think that's the general argument, but HR needs to be the table. Like it needs to be the foundation upon which all of the decisions are being made because HR is everything to do with the, the people management, the organizational leadership, the people components, the human capital of the organization. Nothing in the organization happens without the human capital. So we have to, you know, if we want a sustainable, healthy uh, organization that adds value to the market consistently, then we have to have a people-centric, human-centered approach to how we go about running our business, uh, recognizing also that it has to be clearly connected to the, the metrics and the outcomes, and we have to hold each other mutually accountable to achieving those things. So HR you know, isn't just all about the warm, fluffy, every rah, rah, everyone feel good. Um, that's kind of one end of a caricature, a caricature and one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have like this cold, cold hearted capitalist who only cares about money and doesn't care about people. And I think in most organizations, neither is actually happening. You're somewhere in the middle. So the question is, how do we bring better, more clear alignment in our strategic practices so that we can make sure that we're maximizing the potential of our people, of our teams, of our organization, which is largely going to be built upon the human capital of the organization. Yeah. Uh, you know, having done this for obviously a few decades, uh, the leaders that I respect the most in the course of a conversation, they'll quickly identify, and I, I'm quoting several of them right now when I say this, uh, they'll say, hey, I just need a really strong finance person and a really strong HR person. You give me those two things and we can rock and roll. Uh, so yeah, a lot of experience that would uh, support what you just shared, John. So as we get into the conversation, let's talk about your approach at Veris and throughout your career, what you found, you know, in terms of how you want to go about that alignment of collaborative teams and, and you, your tag phrase is rapidly aligning collaborative teams. Uh, I think, I think organizations struggle to align in the first place, let alone rapidly. So how do you go about doing that? And promoting that? So it, you know, it starts with beliefs. And um, quite frankly, uh, these are beliefs that don't line up with everybody out there. And we expect that, know that. And so uh, these beliefs, we believe, we're biased, right, are inherent in being able to deliver rapidly aligned collaborative teams. Number one is understanding that strategy execution is a social process. And I'm not the first person to say that. Uh, there's plenty of researchers, those over the years, that have said, hey, uh, it's the human connectedness. And John, I've listened to some of your podcasts. You've had guests that come on and have talked about the fact that never before in the history of humankind have we been so connected digitally, yet workers are so desperate for human connections 
that depression's up, suicides are up, disengagement's up. And so we start with this belief that we've got to have a system of human meaning, meaning in human connections. So that's number one, strategy, execution, social process. Number two is understanding that uh, changing behaviors is not an intellectual exercise. It's the business of the heart. We are emotional beings. I think it's Daniel Goleman and his research, of course, emotional intelligence guru. Uh, and I think I'm getting this data right. So that up to 91% of our decisions and how you and I are going to interact, John, are based upon how we feel about one another. And not what I think about you, but how I actually feel about it. Now, we know this, right? Let's go back to how to win friends and influence. People have been telling us for years. It's, it's how people feel about one another. So what do leaders all too often do is they'll put data on a spreadsheet. They'll make the intellectual case for change. But at the end of the day, if we're not actually activating certain emotions and doing that in a way that connects us as humans, we're going to be sorely disappointed. What, what we've done is identified ways to make sure that we're doing this in a psychologically safe way that is not rah-rah, fluffy, touchy-feely, but is actually driven by science. And then create simple mental models that drive a common language so we can drive those beliefs and bring them to life. There's one more belief, if you don't mind, John. Um, We fundamentally believe that the whole person is a much stronger leader, a better collaborator, is more likely to be aligned with other peers um, if if they're a whole person. And so all our methodology can actually be applied at home with friends and family. So we're not giving our families our leftovers. Uh, and so that's the third belief that drives the outcomes we're promising. Yeah, I love that. We do need to bring our whole authentic self to the work that we do, to the relationships that we're a part of, whether that's the work in relationships at home, in our community, at work, whatever, right? Ultimately, everything we're talking about in terms of this alignment and collaboration, this is what we do in all aspects of our life. Um, mm. Uh, it, it's not just a place for the workplace. Uh, it's, it's not just a focus for the workplace. And, and so I really appreciate you tying it back to that. And, and it can help us to live more meaningful and fulfilling lives with deeper relationships uh, throughout the different aspects of our life. So I think that's a tremendous. The rapid piece, um, mm-hmm. so da- data-driven, but connecting to emotions, that's how, what I'm hearing you say, and then you laid out uh, a few principles um, that also help as we try to achieve that. What I observe in many organizations, perhaps most organizations, is that they say they want collaboration. They say they want meaningful connections and partnerships, um, and they say they want creativity and innovation. Yep. Uh, Yet, a lot of times, the, the policies, practices, procedures, the systems of the organization are actually undermining that very value, that very intention and aspiration. What, what do you and your team do as you're going into organizations, as you're trying to help them to think through how they can go about truly aligning values with mission and, and vision of the organization and connecting with everyone on the team? Um, so we can have this collaboration while recognizing sometimes the systems themselves, it's, it's not just a culture thing. Uh, a lot of times the systems themselves really discourage or, you know, actively uh, yeah. damage the ability for us to, to collaborate effectively. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? 
Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy, courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. I'm going to share a four-step process that uh, has been refined over the you know the decades we've been doing this, and I want to give as much value as we can to your listeners. Uh, I think, John, your your comment around the system we're in it obviously influences how people behave. So what can leaders do if I've got a team of three, a team of five, a team of 100? We can do this uh, with those areas where we have greatest influence. Number one is align to imperatives and not just the number, not just the outcome, but the human imperative as well. And so these are classic, right? Most leaders are going to recognize this. What is, what is our vision for success? What is the number we're promising? And then what's key here? is what are we going to be thinking, feeling, and doing as we deliver those imperatives? So we're having conversations about that. What's happening at this moment is we're starting to create a shared reality. Where organizations stumble and have so much difficulty is they're coming to the table. They've got all these responsibilities, disciplines, and functions, and so forth, but they're not operating from a shared reality, which makes it virtually impossible to actually align to an imperative. Another key in that that first step of aligning to imperatives, John, again, this is classic textbook stuff, right? Most organizations are famous for saying, here's why. Here's why we have to do it. Grow market share, um, improve our customer uh, uh, satisfaction metrics, so on and so forth. Very few leaders are doing what I think the magic makers are doing. And that's saying, okay, here's why the organization wants us to do this or why we need to do it. I'm going to pause. And John, I'd like to hear from your perspective, why do you think it's critical we do this. Until we personalize the imperative, until we bring personal meaning to it, we're not going to get the best effort and people are going to be less reluctant to align and collaborate in delivering on that imperative. Now, i got three more steps, but I'm going to pause. I want to be at a good interviewee for you. No, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so I think starting with the why, that's something 
that frankly, I, I mean, organizations do it. And you're right. A lot of times they never get past the organizational why. Uh, frankly, a lot of organizations don't even get there. <laughs> so, 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 so get there. Like that's, you know, you need to, you need to understand that, but then you're absolutely right. Like we need to take the next step. We need, if we're talking about decision-making and, and generating buy-in via emotion, in addition to the metrics, in addition to the data-driven kind of decision-making, then we have to connect to people and their individual why. And the reality is it's different for everyone. So I could be working at the, the greatest kind of social impact organization making a difference in the world. And I would suspect an organization like that would probably largely attract people who are driven by that mission, those values, and they would share that kind of a why. Um, but even then, there's going to be some people that don't actually care all that much about that, but they, they, their why is something that's still meaningful to them uh, that you can still tap into. So I, I don't mean to throw any like occupation under the bus or anything, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like, let's say I'm like an awesome coder. I, I'm just, I kill it with coding. Maybe I don't actually care all that much about whatever the social impact of the organization is, but I just want to do really cool code. I want to work with the best people. I want to create and innovate and and do new things. Uh, Maybe that's my why. And ultimately, whatever the delivery system of the organization and the output of the organization doesn't really matter to me all that much. That's still okay. Like we can still get that great talent, bring them into the organization and help him or her connect their why to the organization's why. And, and then the reality is, you know, most of us don't work for organizations, you know, that have like this huge, you know, societal, social kind of good kind of a mission. Uh, and so we need to figure out what our why is. We need to understand why we exist. What's the point of us being here <laughs> instead of another organization? And then connect that back to your people because you may have a thousand employees. You may have a thousand different individual whys. And you, as a leader, I need, that's part of my job as a leader is to help my team connect to the, the larger overarching mission, vision, purpose of the organization. You're right. So many organizations just completely miss that. They take it for granted. They just assume, you know, someone's working for us. So clearly they must align um, or they think in the interview process, they can just kind of suss it out. And, and then that's all they need to do. Right underneath the surface of what you just shared is really something critical. Most of the organizations stay, of course, heavily matrix. I've got multiple bosses that I need to report to. When we ask that personal why question during that first step of lying to imperatives, we will undoubtedly discover that they actually have a bigger why somewhere else in the organization. And, and I want to caution and encourage the leaders that are listening right now. Lots of times people are saying, well, 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 that's bad. Actually, it's really good news. If we discover that the deliverable we have is not as important to some other deliverables that they have in the organization, let's get that ferreted out early. Let's discover that early so we can have an honest conversation around how big a priority this deliverable is. This is how we rapidly align teams. This is our first step that's real critical. Yeah, and that creates that solid foundation. I I love it. I love it. Uh, So what are the other three? Yeah, so once we identify the imperatives, uh, what it looks like, feels like, uh, and and uh, to to drive those motivations, that fire to get there. Now we can have a more honest conversation around the barriers that are in the way of us delivering on that in in a rapid way. Uh, and I want to emphasize the barriers, two barriers, barriers that are under our control. Most organizations super safe to talk about barriers that are out of our control. Takes up a lot of unneeded, you know, the time. Number two are the barriers that are interpersonal by nature. For example, one of the organizations we work with, um, and actually this would apply to several, uh, when we began working with them, there was a uh, a obvious lack of candor, the ability to tell the truth. There was a heavy emphasis on professional politeness versus professional delivery, right? The the discipline. Uh, And so through this process, we discover that, hey, we can actually tell the truth faster. If we could tell the truth faster to form a shared reality, we're going to much more effectively deliver on those imperatives. So second step, have an honest conversation around the barriers that are under our control and specific to how we operate with one another. And I couldn't help but kind of chuckle to myself as you were saying that because, yeah, I'm thinking of one particular organization where they they put a lot of time and energy talking about professionalism and about collegiality. 
And these are, these are code words to them <laughs> because nobody's going to argue that you don't want professionalism and you don't want people to be collegial and, and kind to each other. That obviously everyone wants that. It's code word though. It's, 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 it's their way of shutting down conversation <laughs> and, and keeping people from pushing back on the status quo and, and challenging the hierarchy. Right. And, right. and people aren't stupid. Like they, they know that. And, 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 and so it just shuts down innovation uh, and people tend to take the safe route in that environment. And that's just to the detriment of the organization. Indeed. Gary Pisano of Harvard, a lot of work on innovation, of course, um, has these paradoxes and he talks about the, the organizations that are truly innovating. Uh, they have this psychological safety with, he uses the term brutal candor, brutal scares quite a few folks out there who are used to this high level of professionalism and so forth. Uh, and, and so let's just talk about, you know, honest candor, you know, fill in any words you want, but those two need to go together. If we're truly going to innovate, discussing the barriers, having an honest conversation around that builds our awareness. And as again, Daniel Goldman says, you can predict someone's ability to change by measuring their awareness. So that second step is critical. Awesome. So step number three. Step number three is that identify the values uh, the cultural norms that we're going to have to consistently model to break those barriers to deliver our imperatives. And so we, of course, experts in developing uh, enterprise-wide collaboration. Inherent in that is, of course, transparency, trust, uh, and so forth. Organizations at this point don't need to reinvent the wheel. But what we encourage leaders to do, like those that are listening, is it can be one of your corporate values, but most valuable is to actually ask your team members, hey, how do we need to operate together to break this barrier that we just discussed and allow your team to actually identify it? This is what we call the human imperative. Someone's going to speak up and say, you know what? We just need to have each other's backs. You know what? We just need to be all in early with one another. Hey, someone's going to say, we just need to be one team. And then we as leaders... I don't have to create a lot of PowerPoints on this. I can simply say, hey, what does it look like for us to do that? How do we do that consistently? How will we measure our ability to do that? So step number three, identify the cultural norm, the value, the human behavior required to break those barriers. Yeah, and that just takes a little bit of time, open conversation within an environment of psychological safety, like you said, and a willingness to push back on the status quo norms. Uh, and, and to just challenge and question, like, why, why, why are we doing this? We've always done this. It's set up this way. This is what the policy is. Doesn't need to be that way. Uh, there's nothing sacred about any policy practice or procedure in any organization. <laughs> like they can all, ch- they were all created at some point, they can all change. And, and so we just need to ask ourselves, does it make sense? Uh, and a lot of times it doesn't. And we, so we can shift it and we can change and we can thereby take away some of our biggest hurdles uh, that are keeping us from being effective. All right, number four. Number four. So what we're doing is where there's a a progress here, progression of moving from what to ultimately the how. And so step number four is where we need to ensure that our our employees, our team members, ourselves, we're equipped then to model that norm, to to create a psychologically safe environment. Just talking about it means it's only going to be rhetoric. And so that's where, of course, we have our area of specialty uh, is equipping organizations to then model the behaviors to break the barriers to living imperatives. Um, but there's a ton of tools out there. There's, you know, there's many, many frameworks. There's many methods. What's most important is that we're identifying the method, the how to deliver that cultural norm. We're practicing it. As leaders, we're insisting that we're modeling it uh, and that we're assessing our progress in applying it. Well said, Craig. It has just been a pleasure. I note the time we've only scratched the surface and starting to lay out this framework and there's so much more that could be said, but for the sake of time today, I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. I wanted to close by giving you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. You got it. Uh, First of all, uh, I'd like to thank your listeners because undoubtedly if they're listening, they're already doing a lot of this. Um, And it's difficult, right? It's never been so volatile, so uncertain, so ambiguous. Uh, I just want to thank leaders for stepping forward, delivering the human imperative to the extent they can keep up that work. 
Uh, if they'd like further support, want to know more about us, you can find us at verusglobal.com, V-E-R-U-S global.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, of course, Craig Ross, um, any number of ways. If you're ordering books, they can find it you know, in booksellers, do big things and so forth. Final thoughts, final thoughts. Um, you know, it takes courage. It takes courage for people to tell the truth, but they will when we understand that leaders, leadership matters, but only teams deliver. And so let's emphasize the development of leaders, but in the context of their teams. Um, and so I'm excited about what your listeners are going to be able to do as a result of this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Craig. It has just been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Craig and his team can do for you. Check out the book, check out the great resources. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode 
of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.